We continue reading today from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, uh, chapter 3, where we hear one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible, beginning in verse 16. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. May God add God's blessing to the reading and the hearing of these words. If you would please stand if you are able for the reading of the gospel. Reading from the gospel of John chapter six, uh, where we hear John's version of the feeding of the 5,000. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never hunger, and the one who believes in me will never thirst. That wasn't part of the scripture reading that, that we, we, we heard read this morning by Pastor Cheryl. It's in the sixth chapter of John, which is the chapter we're in. It's just the 35th verse, not the first nine verses. But I would tell you, in reading the Gospel of John, it's always important to understand a, a fuller picture of what John is talking about anytime John gives us a miraculous sign of what Jesus does. And indeed, that's what we see this morning. This feeding of the 5,000, you've probably heard over and over and over again. And in fact, it is the one gospel story that all four gospel writers have. In fact, Matthew and Mark have two versions of it, one where there are 5,000 people fed, one where there are 4,000 people fed. There are scholars who think it's perhaps the same story, but just told twice in those Gospels for amplification. So somehow this particular story seems extremely important to all the Gospel writers in illustrating who Jesus is and in our revelation of who Jesus is, seeing who God is. So that 35th verse of the 6th chapter of John says... I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never hunger. The one who believes in me shall never thirst. That helps us remember that John's gospel is as much vertical as it is hor horizontal. John's gospel is as much literal and concrete as it is symbolical of what it is that we are to, to, lear, to learn and to know in our spirits, not only in our way of being each day in our lives. John wants us to look up and in and through and around, as well as to hear the information that we're getting from these stories. If you remember with me, Jesus has called the disciples to come away by themselves. He wants them to, to rest because many people were coming and going where they were and they didn't even have leisure to eat, Jesus says from last week's Gospel of Mark. Maybe Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the words that Cheryl read this morning, maybe that's a prayer that we might consider before this grand meal. 
that not only the masses will share but the disciples. The, the end of that prayer says this, I, I pray that you have the power to comprehend the breadth, length, height, and depth and the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Not a bad prayer before a meal. And not a bad prayer to remind us that we need more than physical food to fill us. We need also spiritual food, whatever this fullness of God is. And I would invite you and challenge you to understand with me, I think that's what John is trying to get us toward in his gospel reading this morning, this report of the feeding of the 5,000. And, and the, the heart of the difference of John's report of the feeding of the 5,000 from the other three is the ninth verse, the last verse that Cheryl read in our reading this morning. When Simon, Pe when Simon Peter's brother Andrew says, this little boy has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Remember with me, as Jesus called these disciples away, he wants them to have a time to report on their missionary journeys all the while Jesus has in his eyesight coming over the horizon this mass of people that are in need of so, so many things. They are in need, he evidently thinks, of his compassion because it says he has compassion for the crowds because they are like sheep without a shepherd. They are in need of knowing, evidently, his compassion, that he feels with them their loneliness. He feels with them their outsider status, as Stephen Garnis Holm perhaps reminded us this morning in our beginning words. They had need of knowing that they mattered to a God that seemed far too distant. They had need to know, perhaps, that their anxiety for the future was cared about by a loving deity who had chosen to come to earth in human form. Let's see. They had need in their anxiety, in their hunger, in their loneliness, in their doubts about the future. Does that sound familiar? Do you, do you know what happened a week ago Saturday at that backyard party that we had here at the church? You know what happened? Nothing and everything. Nothing happened that a pastor would probably have scripted. There was no sermon. There were no hymns, although I sang at the top of my lungs as we were taking the tents down after the event was over along to the contemporary music that Danny was playing from the trailer gate. And I think everybody who was helping to tear down the tents, well, I was about to say enjoyed it, but I think that probably wasn't the case. There was not even an offering taken, and we had friends a crowd. Do you know how hard that is for a pastor? Nothing happened, but everything happened. Everything that invited people to understand that they weren't alone in their loneliness over the last year and a half. Everything happened that helped people know that we wanted to feed them with those hamburgers and hot dogs, but we also wanted to feed them with the conversations of reflecting who we are as a people of faith. Nothing happened, but everything happened as we had the need to have some fun, and so we threw water balloons at each other. And we laughed. Nothing happened but everything happened when at least two different couples showed up that we'd never met before. And they found out a little bit of what it's like to be a part of the family at Grace. If only but for a short while. So nothing happened but everything happened. Maybe Jesus was feeling a little bit the same way as he saw these crowds coming and he was surrounded by these disciples and as they came he saw their great need and so Jesus asks this question, where shall we go to buy bread enough to feed all these people? And Philip answers, there is not enough money for us to buy food enough for these people. Even six months worth of wages would not buy enough bread for these people. He missed Jesus' question. Jesus didn't say, how will we buy enough bread for these people? He says, where shall we go to buy enough bread for these people? And then is when 
Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, takes a stab at answering that question. And he says, exclusionary to John, there is this little boy who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? And Jesus takes the boy's offering and he gives thanks and he distributes the food. He doesn't take the loaf, bless it, and break it and give it to the disciples. This is not a communion experience. We are not at the Last Supper. Jesus is shown the boy's offering. He takes it, give thanks, and Jesus, in John's gospel, distributes the bread's And the fish also, the story says, and everyone was filled and he looks at these doubtful disciples and he sends them out to collect the fragments, John's gospel says, because to Jesus, every fragment is valuable. And remember in John's gospel, there is more than one meaning. To Jesus, no fragment is to be left behind. So he sends the disciples out to collect the fragments that are left over. And do you know that 12 disciples go out and 12 baskets come back and all of them are full? Does it answer Philip's question? We don't have enough money. Even six months wages would not pay enough for bread for this group of people. And Philip's basket comes back full. And Andrew says, well, here's a little boy with five loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? And Andrew's basket comes back full. And Peter's, and John's, and James, and Simon the Zealot, and Nathaniel's, (laughs) and Matthew the tax collectors, and Thomas the doubter, and James the lesser. All of them come back with their Baskets full. What happened that day on that mountain surrounded by crowds of 5,000 men not counting women and children? What happened? Nothing perhaps but that hungry people got fed or everything. That people got fed and more than that they received comfort and care. They received the love of Christ in their midst. They received whatever it was that they needed in that moment through the power of the faith of a God who says that Jesus will not see outsiders. Now, now let, me, let me bring us back a moment. And I'm not the first one, nor will be I be the last, that has this thought about this scripture. Many preachers and Bible scholars have posed this possibility. In John's story, there's a little boy in verse 9. And he evidently steps forward when Jesus is asking the questions of these adult disciples who are dumbfounded about how and why Jesus would ask ask them to feed 5,000 people. Evidently, this little boy, for whom 5,000 men, plus women and children, which may have made it 10 or 15 or even 20,000, probably to that little boy, it looked like the world. And yet he still brought what he had. And so some of us wonder if when that little boy stepped forward to feed the world, And Jesus gratefully received his gift and gave thanks that maybe the disciples remembered, hey, wait. We were talking to Jesus before we got in a boat and crossed over. And there were so many people coming and going, we didn't even have leisure enough to eat. It doesn't say they didn't have food to eat. It said they didn't have leisure enough. They didn't have time enough to eat. So maybe that food that they didn't have time to eat, maybe they still had that, but they didn't bring it forward because they knew it wasn't enough. But then the boy brings his, what? The boy brings his bread and fish forward. And Jesus is thankful. And so maybe the disciples looked at each other and said, well... If Jesus is thankful for that, maybe maybe we should bring ours 
forward. You, you, you know the, the term pay it forward, right? We weren't the first ones to think of that. You do realize that. The movie about that wasn't the first to think about that. Do you suppose maybe that started with Jesus and this little boy? That when his lunch came out with full generosity that the disciples' lunch came out, and maybe there were some other people who when they realized they were going to come, have to come around to where Jesus and the disciples were, that was a long trek from any of the villages that maybe they, they ought to bring a little food along with them because it was already afternoon pushing into evening. And maybe when Jesus said, have everyone sit down, that when they all sat down together and watched Jesus thankful for this little boy's offering, that suddenly their food began to come out and maybe there wasn't just enough. Maybe when everybody brought out what they had because their hearts had been changed in generosity, maybe there not only was enough, there was more than enough. In fact, there was so much that Jesus wanted all of them to know that God is a God of abundance and not scarcity. And when we're selfish, it's when we're afraid that we won't have enough. And when we're generous, we're generous because we believe there will always be more than enough. Last fall or winter, I, I can't remember when, I received an email from a family in this church. The Center of Grace had closed down from in-person meals on Wednesday and Thursday nights and they were giving out meals to go at the curb, both for lunch and for dinner. And whether they reached out to Pastor Sylvia or Pastor Sylvia reached out to them, I think they reached out to Pastor Sylvia and Pastor Sylvia said, yeah, the way you could help is if you would prepare a meal. And they said, for how many? And she said, well, for all the people who come on Wednesday nights. And she gave them a number. And they said, sure, no problem. And then they looked at each other and realized they'd never fixed food for 400 people before <laughs> in their kitchen. And they suddenly became terribly afraid, as the email told me. There were just two of them. Pretty new members within the last two or three years. And they worked all day. And they got more and more anxious and more and more nervous that they would get everything done on time, that they would get everything taken over to the center on time, that there would be enough food for whoever all wanted to come. And do you know, they did, it did, and everybody got fed. And there were four or five meals left over. And they said at the bottom of the email, Pastor Nanette, what we realized at the end of the day is that the blessing was ours far more than the people who received the food that we prepared for them to eat. And I wrote back, I beg to differ, I would guess the receivers would have said they were far more blessed than those who prepared the meal. And then I realized <laughs> it wasn't just the givers who were blessed and just the receivers who were blessed, that when you put all of that together, there was more than enough blessing for all who were a part of that meal. And you know the full basket of fragments left over was their email response back to me that said, we can't wait to do this again. Do you know that in the Gospel of John in the 10th chapter, it's a it's another set of verses about Jesus being a shepherd. Remember in Mark, Jesus sees the people and he says they were like sheep without a shepherd. In John's gospel, in the 10th chapter, Jesus is again talking about the people being a sheep and being led astray by the wrong voice, but the shepherd's voice will call them in through the gate. And, and in the midst of that, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's John 10 verse 10, the last half of verse 10. <laughs> Jesus didn't come that we might have life and have it scarce fully. <laughs> Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. In reality, that little boy looking out at the crowds, again, it must have appeared to be the world. And he didn't say, at least it wasn't recorded, that he said to Jesus, you can have my knapsack of five loaves and two fish if you only feed Jewish people. 
You can have my knapsack of, of five loaves and two fish if you only feed the Romans. You can have my knapsack of five loaves and two fish if you only feed those who have been educated classically grief. You can have my five barley loaves and two fish if you only feed those who are the poorest of the poor or the richest of the rich. He just evidently offered what he had. And miraculously it multiplied. We have to reconnect with the world that too often in this day and time we see as enemy. Jesus doesn't ask us simply to feed those who, who we recognize and who look like us. Jesus asks us to feed the world that includes, includes Afghanistan. Asks us to feed the world that includes Germany that's flooding right now. Asks us to feed the world that includes China that is also experiencing great flood. And we say, wait a minute. It's those people that are at fault for us having a pandemic. Do you know that I think if we studied this Bible, we would find a lot of people who are at fault for a lot of bad things in the scriptures that Jesus calls into ministry? I don't know. Let me think about Paul, who when he was Saul was the greatest persecutor of followers of the way of Jesus. God does not draw lines where God's love is concerned. Listen again to the end of Paul's prayer this morning. I pray that you have the power to comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Let me add my prayer. I pray that we each have the heart of that young boy who when seeing the whole world offers his lunch. I pray we have the heart of compassion of Jesus who when seeing a needy crowd seeks to find ever more ways to feed them. I pray we have the heart of those doubting disciples who are some, day fill, some days filled with faith and other days seemingly have none, who yet, when Christ calls them, goes out with empty baskets and realizes as they pick up the fragments that they are fuller than they ever thought they could be. I pray that we have the heart of faithful Jesus followers in our day and our time that seek only to reach out with open hands with the abundance of Christ and the fullness of God's love. Amen.